Welcome to the ISO Show, dispelling myths and sharing tips for success to improve your business with ISO standards with your host, Mel Blackmore. Hello and a happy new year to all of our ISO Show listeners. I hope you had a great Christmas break. Well, to launch into 2024, I thought I would reflect back on the top five podcasts in terms of popularity that we published in 2023. Before I do that, I'd like to give a special shout out to Steph Churchman, our communications manager, who, you know, without her, this podcast would not be possible. So thank you so much, Steph, for your patience with me and also your superb organizational skills with you know, preparing our guests that come on to the podcast and also your patience and dedication to the editing and publishing of these podcasts. So yeah, without you, this would not be possible. So yeah, very, very grateful for you being able to do that for us and bringing this podcast to our international audience. So yeah, so basically Steph highlighted that the top five were Actually, mostly around ISO 27001, which isn't surprising given the fact that we were going through big, big changes with 27001. So back in October 2022, the new standard was announced. That's ISO 27001 2022. So we started doing some podcasts early in 2023 and without a doubt, they were the most popular. So the most popular out of those was what are the new 11 controls in ISO 27001. So everybody was keen to listen in on that one. And the other one that was really popular was what's new with ISO 27001. So for those organizations that haven't started that journey on ISO 27001, I definitely recommend going back to episodes 130, what are the new 11 controls in ISO 27001. And also episode 128, which is what's new with ISO 27001. So I'm going to provide you with a snippet now on 128, which is the first one that we published on what's new with ISO 27001. So yeah, really keen to to hear about the new standards. So yeah, what's new, Steve? Well, for me, it's been an ever-moving target. You sort of look at the 27002 standard and you think, oh, yeah, I've just got that battened down. And then every time you go back and look at it and reread it, you suddenly think, no, there's another way of interpreting this. Mm. So I think that's going to be the bit of fun that uh, people are going to come across. But that's not a bad thing because I think with all these standards, we should be adapting any standard to fit our organisation and not the other way around. So that's so important we do that. Definitely. But uh, 27001 came out uh, finally on the 26th of October, which was great. That brought with it 24 changes and clarifications in the clause sections uh, alone. And plus, on top of that, there's all the changes in the controls. But uh, personally, I I think it's a very good change. I I like the way they've laid it out, particularly the controls. Now they've laid it out to four groups. It could make it easier if um, the ISO people or whoever decide to add extra controls, or even if an individual in an organization decides to add extra controls, they can simply add it to the most appropriate group because there's only four groups. So let's say they had an extra control they wanted to add around uh, HR that no other company has that they have, then they could add that in as an extra control. I've got one particular company I go to that has a specific screening requirement that no other company has so that might be something they get added to their statement of applicability just a quick question there then steve sorry to interrupt but um, that's all right i know that we talked about the changes in relation to iso 27002 which was yeah a bit of a warm-up exercise really for the new 27001 coming out could you just remind our listeners of what those four groups are please yeah, those four categories, uh, Mel, those are quite interesting. There's organisation, there's people, there's physical, and then there's technological. So they're nice groups in the sense they're quite broad, but you can easily fit other controls under those uh, headings if you wanted to. 
So let's say you have a brand new physical control come in. You might have something added to your system that isn't really catered for in the current uh, controls. Then just add that in as an extra control. So at the moment we finish at uh, A.7.14. Why not add A.7.15 as your extra control? It's as easy as that. We don't have to stick to what's in the statement of applicability. We can add to it and make it meet our needs in that sense. So an example of that could be like a visitor's policy. So it's really clear for a a company what to do when you have a visitor. Absolutely. Although that might be catered for in some of the other controls, yeah, if you wanted to bring it out and uh, and make sure it's an actual defined control, then yeah, why not bring it out? Mm. Because I do know some organisations and and some uh, locations do have very strong visitor policies in place that Mm. must be followed. Mm. Especially if it's something like, I don't know, a data centre. Well, you know, you need to prepare people in advance before they come and, you know, on site, like providing ID and, you know, what to expect during that visit. Mm. Very much so, yes. Yeah. And and it could be an MOD site or a government site where there's very strict uh, requirements of getting on site. And so that might be uh, the need to actually bring that out as a control. Mm. Yeah, no, sorry. Thanks very much for that. I just wanted to, to recap on those four groups. And uh, yeah, just a reminder for our listeners that more information on these groups and and also on specific controls are in those episodes 109 to 114. And we covered quite a few, didn't we? Yeah, that was covered quite uh, a lot in those uh, discussions. Okay, great. So they're the groups. And then you mentioned that there are, I think you mentioned there are 24 changes in the classes, but you also mentioned that it's resulted in a bit of a shake-up of the controls. Yes, yeah. Well, it's, it's 24 changes and clarifications. And what I mean by that is that there are uh, specific changes that are required, but there are clarifications of the existing clauses where some of the wording has been tidied up. Right. Just so it makes it absolutely clear what's required. So it doesn't require an organisation to necessarily change what they're doing, but uh, it makes them more aware of what was required of that clause so uh, th- that's fairly straightforward then there are the controls and uh, there are 11 new controls of course and then we've got i think it was about 56 controls were all whittled down to about 24 controls and then we've got 58 controls that have not been changed what that's done with the control uh, section in the annex a is actually made it simpler it's got rid of that deja vu feeling that's good news <laughs> thank well, goodness right. for that <laughs> It's like Groundhog Day with some of the controls, wasn't it? It was, yeah, because you, you were reading something about sort of installing uh, software and two more controls later, you're reading something about uh, installing software and you're thinking, but I've already done that, you know, <laughs> and it caused confusion. And basically it's the same thing, but uh, dealt with in slightly different ways, you know. So one was the, about the control of uh, putting software in and one was the prevention of software being put in by everybody and anybody in the organisation. So why not pack that in together into one single control as they've done now? Mm, Makes complete sense, doesn't it? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Uh, For me, the thing that's been tidied up the most is uh, section A.9, which was the access control. That's really been tidied up. There were so many controls in there that just kept repeating themselves or were just sort of uh, minutiae detail of uh, a single control. It just got very, very confusing. and. Now they've tidied that up and and lumped those together into perhaps about three or four controls. It just makes life a lot easier if we're going to be implementing this. And I'm sure most organisations, when they read those controls now, will get a better handle on what's going on. So the other really popular podcast that we had, was, which was actually the most popular podcast from 2023, was the all about the 11 new controls. And this was an interview with Steve Mason, a managing consultant here at Blackmars, and he basically went through an overview on what the 11 new controls were and also looking at some context behind those. So, you know, why have these new controls been added and what's the key purpose? So that was a really interesting podcast and we referenced different resources uh, such as the Isology Hub. So that was a go-to place for the ISO 27001 transition game plan that we created and also 
basically an overview of the 56 controls that were then combined into 24 newly titled controls with the 11 new controls that were added on. So we did reflect on the fact that 58 existing controls remained unchanged. Obviously, we didn't go through those in detail. But we then started to go through some of the new controls in further detail. And that's where that podcast referenced out to some of those other episodes. So they were episodes 111, 12, 13 and 14. Here's a quick snippet from when Steve's talking about some of those new controls. Over to you, Steve. What are the uh, the new changes to the controls? Right. Thank you, all, uh, Mel. Thank you. Well, I think the first thing to say is that uh, with these new controls, people shouldn't uh, panic about them, shouldn't worry about them, because they've really been introduced because the standard is catching up with technology. And I think in many cases, as I've experienced with some clients I've been talking to already, uh, these controls are already being done by clients in their management system. The technology is out there now within the systems we use to be able to show that these controls are being addressed. So that's the first thing, don't worry about the controls because just look at what your systems can do and see whether those meet the requirements of standard. But the first one we've got is uh, 8.5.7, which is threat intelligence. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's about an organization has to provide awareness of any of the threats that uh, might be coming in their direction and demonstrate they're putting an appropriate mitigation in place to address those threats. Now, threat uh, intelligence can come from many, many different sources. There's lots of online uh, systems on place on, on the internet that can uh, help you. You can go into the government websites like the NCSC, go into MI5, perhaps into the police websites for some of the general type uh, threat intelligence. But um, also you've uh, got all the tools around there that uh, people are now putting into their systems where they can actually identify whether there are phishing attacks likely to happen, all that sort of thing. So really it's about um, an organization understanding where they're going to get their information from and then how they're going to use that information to strengthen their management system, strengthen their systems that are currently in place. So that's really the approach we need to be taking there. And we need to think also that threats aren't just about uh, computer threats. It could be about external threats, physical threats. So what's your threat intelligence for physical threats? And one of the good places to go is um, the police.uk website, where you can put in your postcode and you can actually identify the sort of crime that is happening in your area and when it's happened. So then that gives you an idea of if there are thefts going on in your area, that's a, a physical threat to you as an organization. So you might want to sort of look at your physical security. So don't just narrow this down to system threats. Also think about your physical threats uh, as far as this is concerned. So that's your threat intelligence side. The next one we've got is. A.5.23, information security for use of the cloud. Now, we've been using the cloud for a long time and you know, probably can't think back to when we weren't using the cloud. It's becoming more and more popular to store things in the cloud, A, because of the simplicity, B, because it's much more secure than any of the other systems we've had in place in the past. What organizations need to be thinking about is who are their service providers who are their cloud service providers and are those cloud service providers you know built to have the security in place we've got the big boys out there we all know about uh, and they're certainly certified to iso 27017 27018 and to 27701 all of which are uh, are sort of cloud related standards in the 27000 field there are also other possibilities of uh, certification, such as CSA Star, uh, Cyber Essentials, and we've then got uh, SOC throughout there. They're all uh, systems that help to demonstrate that uh, an organization has got some sort of cloud security in place. Now, one of the things that organizations can do for themselves is actually consider looking at the Annex A's and Annex B's in those standards I mentioned, like 27017, 27018, 
and 27701 and uh, use those annex to bolster the controls that are already in place for 27001 2022. Okay, so if we look at those standards, I'll, I'll explain what each one is. Uh, the 27,017 is the cloud security uh, standard, straightforward cloud security standard. And there are some controls in there which are labeled CLD. Uh, those are the cloud controls, and those are the ones that uh, could be used to bolster what you've already got in place. There's about 12 of them, so there's not much more to add on to what you've already got. In 27,018, this is really about the protection of PII in the cloud, but it's really from the, the public cloud point of view. So this is really a standard for all the public cloud providers. But there might be some useful tips in there that people could draw on to uh, make sure they've got security in their own cloud uh, and when they're drawing on a service from a public cloud provider. And then finally, we've got the 27701, which is obviously the PII security standard. And again, there are some requirements in there that uh, we have to ensure that you've got the security of the cloud in place. So think about all of those and uh, how they might come to support you in what you're doing. So that's the uh, first couple there. Then we're going to come on to uh, A.5.30. This is ICT readiness for business continuity. Now, there are a couple of uh, standards around that uh, clients might wish to go to. There's uh, ISO 27031, which is the standard about ICT readiness for business continuity. And that's a whole standard that's dedicated to best practice. And in that standard is, is a brilliant a plan do check act cycle for ICT readiness in business continuity. And that may be quite useful to, uh, for organizations to pick up on and perhaps set as their own cycle for business continuity and service continuity. What we're looking for here is um, if organizations have already got 22301 in place, they may want to see how the 27001 is fitting into 22301. So, and typically, it might be that uh, you've got to bolster up your disaster recovery plan in uh, your 27001, because that's really what your IT is about. And one of the things they're uh, implying here is that you ought to have a BIAs around your disaster recovery plan. Have you got that sort of thing in place? Do you truly understand which systems need to be up and running first? Now, that can change day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out depending on what your organization is doing. So mapping out a calendar of which systems and which services are more important to you over the year will help you in your business continuity. Once you've done that with a disaster recovery, you can then go to the business continuity team and say, right, does this align with what you think you have in place? And does it fit in place? And that's really what we're trying to do is make sure that 27 isn't a bolt on to decide a business continuity but it is integral to the plan. Because what you want to, don't want to happen is a disaster hits you and you suddenly find you've been uh, left out in the cold. There, there are some examples here as well that uh, you might be a very, very small organization where you don't actually have the, the resource to do BIAs and probably it's a bit of a sledgehammer to crack a nut. So all I would suggest there, if you're a very small company, uh, perhaps of half a dozen people, do some sort of risk assessment around your business continuity, around your systems. What systems have you got in place? And what is the impact on you if a system goes down? And if you've done a very simple risk assessment around that, that will actually help you identify whether you've got an effective disaster recovery plan in place. So don't go out of your way to, um, to produce a, a massive um, sort of uh, analysis system that's not going to uh, bring you any benefits, but do something that's appropriate to you as an organization. One of the things they are also after in this standard, and if we look at 27,002, it is implying that we should be looking at our recovery time uh, objective and recovery point objective. Remembering your recovery time is the point at which you've recovered and you can keep going. Your recovery point is much further down the line when you've actually perhaps re-inputted the data that you were manually sort of recording during the time of the disaster. So that could be several weeks down the line. Always go to the 
the definitions in 22301 for RTO and RPO, because that's really what we're working to here. These are all in uh, the section which is to do with organization controls. So there's a few changes there. I don't think there's anything that's going to catch people out. If anything, the business continuity one is going to be the one that requires a lot of work because there's going to be a lot of thinking around that. And it might be a bit of uh, re engineering of existing plans. But uh, that should be fairly straightforward. The other standard I wanted to mention, sorry, in uh, A.5.1.3, there was a standard some years ago called BS25777. And this was a business continuity standard for ICT. I don't think it exists anymore, um, other than sort of a, 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 a very old standard. It's certainly not certifiable, but it's very useful documents and very useful information in there. While some of the technology and words might be a little bit out of date, I think the principles uh, still apply, even sort of uh, 14, 15 years down the line since when it was published. So do look out for that standard. It's probably uh, not going to be a, a full price standard anymore because it's not a current standard. We also had some other guests on the podcast that proved to be really, really popular with our ISO show listeners. Uh, so I'd just like to highlight three of those. The first one of which was Credible Carbon Offsetting with Tree Economy. So that was episode number 134. That was a fascinating conversation that was really quite inspirational to hear about Harry Grocott's journey as CEO and co-founder of Tree Economy. So he was talking about how we can demonstrate credible carbon offsettings through schemes here in the UK, which is actually a really challenging job. So a lot of businesses that are doing carbon offsetting and purchasing carbon credits, they're actually doing it with overseas projects. But we know there's a lot of organisations in the UK want to do the offsetting with British schemes. So this was a really interesting discussion when we covered, you know, how to quantify the value of nature. So there were some big questions in there and Harry did a superb job of answering them. You know, also tackling some of those more controversial questions like how can people be sure that they don't fall prey to greenwashing? And also how does somebody go about buying and monitoring offsetting credits? And, you know, what about the verification of these offsetting schemes? So, yeah, here's Harry talking a little bit about the carbon offsetting here in the UK. OK, so you mentioned about nature restoration. Can we actually quantify the value of nature? I know that's a big question to ask. <laughs> I'm going to ask it. I'm going to put it out there. It sounds as though it would be incredibly difficult to do, but can, can we actually quantify the value of nature? I mean, the short answer right now is no, but there's a lot of nuance within that. So natural capital is the framework for, for thinking about this. So the idea being nature delivers lots of different value to us, different services known as ecosystem services. So if you imagine a farm, for example, a farm produces calories. So whether that's wheat or it's corn or whatever that's going to be, that's a service that it delivers. And we price that service. So we, we know that farms give us food and we pay for that food. So that's, you know, nature has value based on, on that principle. Uh, likewise, natural resources like, I don't know, coal and oil in, historically or other minerals, that is a stock of value within nature. And we can kind of get that, that service out of it. But now we're beginning to slowly beginning to price these other services. So carbon removal and storage, we have this big problem of, of CO2 in the atmosphere. So nature and systems, ecosystems that remove and store that carbon dioxide for us as, as humanity is valuable and becoming more valuable. And that's where the carbon market has built in. But then there's really high value, but as yet unquantified areas more broadly around biodiversity, for example, how do you put a price on biodiversity? Like that, that's such a tricky aspect to, to tackle because how do you price that in the UK, for example, if you go from a grouse moorland into a native forest, what is the value of that biodiversity increase versus biodiversity in, let's say, Colombia, for example, how do you, how do you compare those bits? It's incredible to think about, but, but very tricky. The good thing is that it is beginning to get priced. 
so the, the biodiversity aspects that they're looking to start building if not a market then at least some kind of, of system to, to back that england has a biodiversity net gain trial that, that's still ongoing which is a good start because we need to start the, the issue when we only price some bits of nature is that we then optimize for those so you've seen this for example through carbon offsetting a lot of the forests that were created originally were monoculture fast growing forests so good in theory from a carbon removal perspective but, but very bad from a, a biodiversity perspective so we kind of need to be able to price the whole thing at once to have the right incentives to build the, the best possible ecosystem so yeah th there's i'm slightly waffling on on those bits but <laughs> <laughs> you've done a, a grand job in trying to uh, answer that question thanks harry <laughs> but i think the point that you've, you've really clearly made the point there is that it's not just about co2 emissions and offsetting is it there's so much more that we need to consider for our planet you know look you mentioned earlier about rewilding and you know there are various projects going on around that that are having a tremendous positive impact on those environments where that does happen because we have lost a lot of wildlife and, and a lot of nature activities i know that i mean i'm from cumbria originally and uh, and i was reading that many many years ago there were hundreds of orchards across cumbria and and it just makes you think well what what's actually you know because of that losing those orchards you know the wildlife that, that they would attract must have a, a damaging effect on that region let alone you know the country as well if you've got other counties that are similar so yeah i think i think that's you know it's a really good point that you've made that it's about looking at the bigger picture isn't it and nature restoration as opposed to just removing ghg emissions now obviously there's a lot of greenwashing going on I think that has been one of the downsides. I think we've seen, because we, we've been implementing ISO 14001, for example, for about 17 years and ISO 50001, the energy management standard for over 10 years. And now we're implementing the carbon standards. And it's great that the demand for standardization and having robust controls in place for identifying what your environmental footprint is and how you can implement controls are. But one of the downsides to that is that there's a lot of people jumping on the bandwagon and there's a lot of greenwashing going on. And how, co how can people be sure that this doesn't fall under greenwashing? Yeah, it, it is. It's, it's really sad to see that it can be exploited to such a, a large extent for greenwash, the carbon offset market I'm, I'm talking about here particularly. So I think there are two elements here of greenwash. One is at the project level. So the actual carbon credits themselves and, and the impact. Uh, and secondly, it's then at the corporate level, which is where the claims are then getting made. So working with, with the second of those first, obviously the ISO standards and, and that kind of rigorous process is beginning to solve or, or is solving that, that second issue around, are you certified carbon neutral or not? And there's a very clear set of requirements in order to get to that. And I think that's fantastic. And that's exactly what's needed because I think it's worth perhaps just very quickly stepping back the voluntary carbon market is what we're talking about it's now a market about two billion dollars in, in size it's kind of triple tripled or triple doubled over the last couple of years um so it's, it's rapid growth it is a an unregulated market for trading invisible gas so it's it's, it's in somewhat unsurprising <laughs> that, that there is this issue around greenwash and, and false claims because it's very easy to do that there's a forest that you're never going to see and i'm going to sell you some invisible carbon from that site. It's very easy to get, well, to get cowboys operating in, in that market. So it's good if, if the demand side, the corporate element of that is now being buttressed with, with ISO standards, that begins to solve that. The issue then really remains on the actual project and carbon offset side. Now, there are a number of carbon standards. They're called standards, but they don't necessarily hold themselves to the same level as an ISO standard. So I think there's, there's a bit of, of untangling to be done there in terms of wording. In the UK, we have the Woodland Carbon Code and there's also a Peatland Carbon Code. Uh, and they, as it says on the tin, support afforestation and, and woodland projects or peatland protection projects. Internationally, there's four very large standards, the largest of which is called VERA. And they've got this voluntary carbon standard called VCS. So VERA VCS is, is the largest internationally. Now, in theory, those should be setting the requirements and very strict benchmarks for projects to be developed. The issue, as has, has come out very recently through a, a Guardian report that's been published, 
the standards and processes in place for project development are just not that high and not that not that robust which means it's very difficult for the corporate buyer who is going through their sort of iso standard carbon neutral process to actually find the correct offset which is only one part of that whole carbon neutral stack but to find the offset that is appropriate and doesn't let them slip and kind of do the wrong thing because you have all of you have all, all of the wrong incentives you're a company you've got a requirement to generate profit and increasing profit to shareholders or, or to yourself if you're a smaller business so when you see a, a carbon offset that is five dollars or five pounds versus a carbon offset that is 30 pounds in a voluntary market where nobody is telling you to do it there is a strong incentive to pick the cheap one because they all have the same tick box but unfortunately as is now beginning to be evidenced a lot of those credits and a lot of those cheap credits are cheap because there's no process in place to evidence and track impact um, and it's very very easy to slip and that's being generous to companies there's a lot of companies that just don't care and will just tick box buy the cheap one and that's the incentive but the really difficult thing is where you see companies that are trying to do the right thing but make the wrong decision in terms of purchasing and they still slip up and, and they get put into the sort of greenwash bucket kind of cancelled company type outcome so it's very very tricky but there are companies like ours and, and i'm happy to say a number of others in our space that are now beginning to bring an additional level of uh, reporting information and disclosure on projects to actually evidence the impact and i think that's obviously i would say this because it's, it's our company and, and uh you know I, i'd be a poor ceo if i wasn't plugging us but, but you can actually begin to, to really dig into evidence and, and good projects have good reporting that sits above and beyond the very low thresholds for standardization at the moment. Yeah, and I think, uh, I mean, we've seen that when David's had to break a few finance directors' hearts when they're saying, oh, well, what about these options for offsetting, which, you know, could be cheap as chips, but actually they're not meeting the requirements of past 2060. And Dave is like, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> they're just not acceptable and I think there's there's such a lot of education that's needed in this space and uh, raising up awareness and hopefully this podcast is just one tiny way of being able to make people aware that there are credible options for doing this the right way and then there are other cowboy routes and a lot of our podcast listeners will relate to this because in the ISO standards world you can either get certified with like a UCAS accredited certification bodies, that's the United Kingdom Accreditation Service, so the government body that governs the certification bodies, to go down the legitimate route and you get the value from that. Or you can just go online and, you know, pay some money, get a certificate, get a manual, but it's worthless. There's absolutely no value in it because it, it's the dished out, you know, ten a penny. So I think a lot of our listeners will relate to this issue <laughs> that we're currently facing at the moment in the carbon offsetting world as well. Uh, so if one of our listeners was looking to, you know, they've, they've addressed what their carbon footprint is, they've gone through ISO 14064, so they've verified their carbon footprint against a credible methodology such as ISO 14064, and they've done all that they can to reduce their carbon footprint, but now they want to buy some carbon credits. How can somebody go about buying and monitoring those carbon credits? One of the things that I absolutely love about doing this podcast is to share hints and tips based on other companies' experience of their ISO journeys. I mean, that was one of the reasons that I set out to do this podcast. It was about dispelling myths and sharing tips and journeys of success, along with challenges uh, with our ISO show listeners. And Steve Shaw, who's the Chief Product and Technology Officer at Dot Digital, did not fail in this. He was superb. And that could have been an episode that went on for at least two hours, I think. So that's where Steve is talking about Dot Digital's journey on their ISO 14001 implementation and some of their fantastic sustainability initiatives that they've introduced over the last couple of years. So I think this is a perfect example of how an organisation has taken a standard and gone above and beyond with it. 
So this is a, a an episode that I definitely recommend diving back into the archives and listening to. That was episode 136 earlier this year with Steve, where we're talking about those initiatives, what they've learned through the implementation of 14001, and how do they manage their environmental management system now? So here's a quick clip from that discussion. We, we became the first, world's first carbon neutral marketing automation platform. That was ISO 14001 certified, which was amazing. And we've kind of set some lofty targets to be net zero by 2030. And we, we don't have a huge footprint. I think uh, what, what's interesting is an organization, a tech organization, which consumes a lot of aspects such as kind of power and you know, air conditioning, if you're utilizing a lot of uh, hardware. Um, we don't actually have a, a big footprint. I think um, we didn't really have a huge footprint to start, so it was slightly better than we probably thought. But actually to drive it down is, is, is now really interesting because some of the big things we could have done or we did do um, is now becoming harder and harder to get to that kind of net zero. But uh, yeah, we, we manage it regularly. We have um, also people who are super keen. We have our dot green group internally who are kind of all looking at different ways and different ideas around how we can reduce our impact. And uh, we meet regularly, really. Yeah, I remember when you first launched dot green and it was a global launch. And I think what was was really interesting was how it was very inclusive across not just about the business environmental aspects and impacts and the environmental footprint as a business, but what employees could do in terms of making a difference as well. And uh, yeah, I, I was really impressed with the different topics that we covered on the webinar. So you had different speakers. Obviously, I was speaking about ISO 14001, but you had representatives from all sorts of different aspects that that people would be able to feel involved with the dot green community. And I think it it definitely does feel like a community. Uh, what would you say is the the secret behind that? I, I definitely, definitely think you know ha having passionate individuals is is pretty key. It is a huge pleasure to work with um, some people who feel you know similar to I. Having a good exec sponsor, I think um, I'm quite fortunate. I, I sit on the um, leadership team at, at Dot Digital, so being able to voice uh, or have that passion myself as well as that voice to drive change really does help. And I think the last part is, you know, there's, there's no bad ideas. I think, um, you know, it starts at the grassroots in terms of, I think some of our teams were really passionate about uh, some of the offices they were working in pre COVID around how they can make a difference, how they can recycle the coffee filters, for example. But the bit we tried to do is really kind of say, well, look, all of these ideas, all of these thoughts on how we can improve our own kind of environmental aspects. They're all just as important, but how, how do we look at a sustainable sustainability program within the business and how do we measure it? How do we work out whether or not it's working and how do we actually drive change uh, forward and actually get it to a point where it becomes a unique selling point? And I think well, actually for us, it, it, it became a unique selling point quite quickly because we had all of those passionate individuals who worked tirelessly really to, to understand what our makeup was put some of those ideas into reality uh, and make a, make a big difference internally. Yeah, I think it does make a huge difference if you've got a group of sustainability champions within the organisation to help to drive forward, you know, the vision and, uh, you know, especially if, you know, if you've got a, an exec sponsor like yourself that says, right, this is what we'd like to achieve, but, <laughs> you know, you need, you need lots of ideas and suggestions and, and energy to make that happen as well. So, I mean, could you give us an example of one of the initiatives that you've been working on at Dot Green over the last year or so? Yeah, de definitely. We, we've got a couple of good ones, I think. Um, uh, one, one of which was actually from a, a computing point of view, we still had some physical data centers in each of the three regions we operate, one in uh, Europe, one in the US and, and one in uh, Sydney. But we'd identified actually that they, you know, for some of those that we, we knew the, the power mix kind of going into them wasn't kind of on renewables and uh, we, this could be an area that we could improve. So we actually spent two years working with Microsoft, helping them build out their products to be able to enable us to move these final three data centers over to Microsoft's Azure platform, which is uh, running on renewable energy and renewable energy credits and has a lot of uh, really fantastic credentials as a business um, and partner of ours actually to help our, our own footprint really. So that, that was a good one. It actually um, 
materialized in July of last year, 2022, uh, where we migrated those final three data centers away. So we're now a fully, fully fledged cloud operation, cloud SaaS piece of technology, utilizing some of our kind of green partners, such as Microsoft and, and Google. So that, that was a really cool one because uh, it was the last piece of infrastructure to move to, to kind of really make sure there's a big difference there. I think the other is, you know, once you get to a point where you kind of have all of this enthusiasm, it has to leak out, it has to leak out to your partners and to your customers. And actually we, we more recently started uh, assessing some of our kind of footprint in the terms of our customer utilizing our platform. So what is the environmental aspects they're saving really by utilizing us compared to going to one of our competitors? Mm, that's really interesting. Yeah, which is helping them out as well, isn't it? And also leading buying decisions as well in terms of service providers. So if you're helping them to manage their environmental footprint through the service that you're delivering, it's going to make their life easier as well. Exactly, exactly that. And um, I think it was, it was so great to be actually kind of almost calculate what the CO2 emissions were compared to maybe one of the leading competitors who aren't um, on, on a re renewable energy infrastructure such as we are. And then actually kind of email them to say, hey, based on your consumption of us, this is what you would have used, but actually it's, it's zero because you, you've been utilizing our services. So being able to break it down, I think we've got such a great feedback from customers. Some of them wanted to actually put a kind of little uh, note at the bottom of the communications they're sending to their own customers to say sent from a environmentally sustainable platform. Um, so they, they really got involved. And I, I think um, that the feedback was, was fantastic. We've got some amazing brands which have actually chosen to use us um, on the back of us having that accreditation as well as um, having very good green credentials when it comes to services we provide. So yeah, I think they're probably my two favorite examples more recently. Yeah, thanks for sharing that that with me because I think obviously initially we we just established the foundation, didn't we, in terms of establishing that environmental management system. But it really could, does come down to the data and measuring what matters and and looking at those metrics so that you understand where you're at as an organisation. To then it's it's amazing how it's evolved really in terms of that going down through your supply chain and and affecting your customers and having a, a positive impact that way as well. And finally, another podcast that was in our top five was an interview with an organization called RiskX. So during this discussion, I had a chat with James Sharp, who's the chief technical officer at RiskX, and he was sharing with us insights into the top 10 emerging software as a solution trends in health and safety. So many of our listeners will already be certified to ISO 45001. Those that aren't, health and safety is still going to be on the agenda. It is a legal requirement. So James talks about how software solutions can help to make health and safety professionals' lives easier. And that can be by streamlining compliance processes, gathering better safety data, and providing total visibility on the performance of risk management. So it was a really interesting conversation about those solutions and why organizations are leaning towards health and safety software and looking at some of the trends in this area. So yeah, here's a snippet of episode number 135, Emerging Software as a Service Trends in Health and Safety. RiskX have been certified to a number of ISO standards over the years, including ISO 45001, obviously the health and safety standard, the ISO 27001, the information security standard, and ISO 9001, the quality management standard as well, which I believe you've had those in place for quite some time now. So 45, we've done our stage one and we're going to stage two, but we've had 18,001 prior to that. We've uh, 27,009, obviously, as you just mentioned as well. And we don't, use them as badges of honor we we try and run by the standards in regards to the businesses as well because there's a lot to be said about isos either being there because it's helping you with tender processing but for us we actually see them as massive business improvements off the back of them and whilst forty five thousand and one for a software company that's a limited risk why would we do that well it's because we we sing it we are health and safety we live and breathe it for us not to have that certification wouldn't make much sense to the outer world. You have to lead by example. So ISO has been fantastic for that. And we've also aligned 
our system to ISO because we have a lot of organizations that have them and they use a CessNet for evidence of those ISOs. So a lot of our service is, is built around that as well. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, your clients appreciate that as well, that you are living and breathing it. I think it is quite unusual for a software company to, to have that standard. So, yeah, you can speak with, you know, first-hand experience when dealing with, with clients. So that's great. So moving on to emerging software as a service trends in health and safety. So a lot of our ISO show listeners will be using Excel spreadsheets. They might be using software. But obviously, I think since COVID, a lot of more businesses have started to digitalize the way that they work as an organization, look at streamlining, especially if you've got people that are working remotely and they need instant access to their health and safety records and controls and processes on how to operate as an organization. So, yeah, really interested to hear what the trends are in this space, James. So, yeah, if, if you could just provide us with a bit of an overview then, please. So, yeah, I mean, the pandemic for us from a software as a service, it, it really exploded because you all of a sudden had people working remotely and businesses had to operate a little bit more efficiently. So therefore they were looking at the cloud to bring in business-based systems. So for our perspective, you know, health and safety all of a sudden was very fragmented. You had organizations that didn't have electronic systems or they might have had some, but not all. And therefore it was very hard to manage that compliance across a much wider area where they've now got hybrid working or satellite offices and so forth. One of the biggest changes for us when it came to the pandemic and software as a service was the COVID because we were asked by our clients, would we be creating a way of tracking COVID management? And lo and behold, we already were again, because we'd like to innovate. We saw a need straight away that our clients would need some way of track and tracing. COVID and their employees and having a very quick way and method of doing that. So we created a system called Safe Today within about six weeks and then released it actually prior to the government's track and trace system that worked very similar and was very, very effective uh, for our clients and gave them you know, really good statistics. So that's just one story of how software as a service in health and safety and how the changing climate of the, say the pandemic really pushed that forward. And so therefore now with regards to the technical trends, which we'll go over today, that's why they're being shaped and there's more gravitas towards them because software as a service is being seen as a, the place to go now. The companies that were maybe shy of it before or were concerned about its investment didn't have a choice. They had to go to the cloud. Um, and so it's moved people on for the better in my view, because collaboration and distribution of health and safety information within the industry is not always fantastic, especially in bigger businesses where, you know, people at the bottom floor don't necessarily know the top floor's health and safety aspects. And this, this helps that collaboration. Yeah, I think it's fair to say there've been a lot of external influencing factors that have shaped the way that businesses operate over the last couple of years uh, since the pandemic and uh, it still continues to evolve. So where do we begin with these 10 emerging trends then, James? Well, what I'll do, I'll go over them one by one and some of them are fairly technical as well. So what I'll do is bring that down slightly to, to give a, an idea of what they are within the technical space. So if you don't mind, I'll, I'll crack on with those 10 and then we'll, we'll do a bit of an overview on some other key aspects as well. Fantastic. So one of the first trends that we've seen, and some of these you know, won't be a surprise essentially, was artificial intelligence. Um, and whilst we have machine learning, which is another subject a bit later on in the trends, artificial intelligence has been a, a big pusher now where they are looking for systems such as ours and software systems to start making some decisions within health and safety. And it's one thing that we've been looking at quite deeply as well. So, you know, if systems are understanding that incidents are being created, then it should also understand that risk assessments are not changing or your risk is lowering in risk assessments, but your accident rates are going up. So, you know, is there an unbalance there? So artificial intelligence was one of the, the big key trends that came into it, driving data sets, because we're now dealing with lots of information that we now know of in the health and safety world through software as a service. And then what can we get out of that? What intelligence can be made from that to tell us something? 
And outside of that, it's collaboration within other sectors. So, for instance, we deal with a lot of NHS, for instance. You could have one part of that sector then starting to look at the data set of another part of the, the sector as well. And whilst that's you know privacy there, there's not individual information, the intelligence could start telling you something. You know, across logistics, this is the thing that starts to happen the most. These are your critical points in health and safety and control. So artificial intelligence has become a, a big pusher now. The, the second trend I want to go over is what we call API connectivity, which is short for application programming interface. And in short, API is a method of software systems being able to talk to each other. That's really it. It's, it's the ability of being able to buy into a service and then maybe your email system needs to talk to it. Maybe your HR system needs to talk to the safety system or your ISO management system needs to talk to it as well. Doing that is a technology called API. So there's a big push at the moment in cloud systems of them being able to talk to each other relatively simple and relatively easy without a, a huge cost on the consumer. You know, are we working with other systems? And so therefore, again, within Assessnet, it's that ability for your HR service to then talk to the safety management side, you know, when it comes to illness, lost time and so on and so forth. Not having these separate services because the pandemic showed us that having fragmented services doesn't operate, doesn't work. That's why people have gone to the cloud. So that cohesion has become a really big trend now. And systems are starting to have to build what we call APIs, these, these libraries, to be able to, to do that, to connect those systems together. The third trend is what we call low code optimization. Again, another technical term, but it's really important within software systems. And low code optimization basically means that we develop our systems so that they're optimized in such a way that we can build on them and tailor them to your needs really quickly. So what people want from health and safety services now and systems is solutions out there that fit them as well. So it's not you take ours off the shelf and you have to report accidents in a given way. Yes, there's regulatory requirements behind that, which all these systems will be part of, but you might have a specific process that you undertake internally. You might have a specific process that you do internally, which isn't in the system. You know, you buy into a cloud-based service and you want to take on another process and put that into that as well. And the reason for this low-code optimization trend is because we are now looking at um, systems not having a huge cost and time element when it comes to building what you want. So if we optimize it into essentially small packets of code, we can build something very quickly. We can reuse it basically take bits from risk assessment, take bits from accident, take bits from logbook, and then build you something else very quickly. So that's become a really big trend where organizations want to embrace health and safety management systems online, but they also need it to work in their way as well. And they want it to expand with the organization. So that's become a, a really big trend within systems such as ours. The fourth trend is mobile optimization is exactly what it says on the tin. We are ever so connected to devices, uh, mobiles being one of them. And whilst mobile app development took a little bit of a slump prior to the pandemic, it was seen as a, a nice thing to have with your solution, but not maybe heavily used in business. The pandemic has accelerated that twofold. Now we are looking at mobile based developments. Uh, people will utilize things like Teams and so forth on their mobile business connectivity systems and in the health and safety service and solutions such as ours, again, people are looking to have mobile based access. And whilst we have mobile apps ourselves and we have optimization of our system within mobile devices as well, that again is another trend that even we're working on continually into the, the next 18 months because more and more people want it in their hand. Um, and whether it's a good or bad thing that we are now just more connected than ever, you can't deny that trend is, is going to be here to stay. So it's, it's very strange how that technology took a bit of a slump and was more about gaming than anything. And now it's took into business based tools on, on mobile devices. So I hope you've enjoyed listening to a few of those playbacks of some of our most popular podcasts in 2023. I certainly enjoyed recording those podcasts with our guests. And yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure and delight in bringing 
news and updates on standards and sharing those stories of success. I think one of the things that I've noticed with those most popular podcasts is a trend in innovation and going above and beyond, which I'm absolutely delighted by. So it's good to hear that some of those conversations have clearly resonated with our ISO show audience. And I hope that you can share that by passing those podcasts on to other people with a similar interest in whether it's, you know, becoming better in terms of information security through raising, you know, standards in terms of the new controls through to thinking about different ways, new initiatives to improve sustainability or risk management. So yeah, looking forward to recording more podcasts with interesting guests in 2024. If you're a subject matter expert in your field, or if you've got expertise in implementing or managing an ISO management system, I'd love to hear from you. Please do get in touch with us. And you know, if you've got an interesting story that you'd like to share with our listeners, we'd definitely be interested in getting you onto the ISO show. So thanks very much for listening and I look forward to catching up with you on the next ISO show. Looking to use ISO standards to drive better business practice? Contact us at blackmoorsuk.com to access further information and book your free 15-minute call.